why that presentation just demonstrates how important this scrutiny committee is. Because virtually every subject, topic you touched on, is basically a topic for scrutiny. And this is why this we need to look at the structure of the scrutiny committee and the quorum to make sure it runs correctly, it runs properly, it scrutinises what the executive yourselves do, whether it supports or whatever, or gives advice. This is what it's for. And this is, you know, there's various things being touched on here. The rail, Mersey Rail, you know, none of us here were involved in Mersey Rail from day one. Fairs, life, uh, I mean, the bus companies, uh, they're working away with roughly 14% uh, bottom line uh, profits, which is probably one of the higher ends of profit than in other, in other cities. Uh, we seem to be being paid disproportionately higher because of what we are, the stick up with it. On railway stations, I mean, I've fought for nearly 20 years to get lifts in Prescott. Eventually they're coming, only because Shakespeare the North is coming there. Well, you know, these things link up in network rail, unfortunately, uh, our hands are tied. I mean, you're talking about doing a deal with Grayling. Don't forget, ours is a closed network. Uh, if we do, there's an awful lot of items and things, um, water, which is on top of us. <laughs> if the springs are leaked, it could be fearfully expensive to, to fix. But, you know, I think with that presentation, what you've done, Steve, uh, you've introduced what this committee needs to do to scrutinize you, to guide you on your way. Because, uh, you know, you've been in office now just a little over 12 months. I think you've uh, addressed and met every one of your promises, which is superb. You know, there's very few other metro mayors could do that. Uh, but another 18 months to go, and hopefully you'll be doing more promises uh, for us to scrutinize. Thanks very much, Steve. One more comment and a question. Thanks, Ken. Um, well, you're right uh, in regards to the, the function of this committee. It's really to hold the executive to account, and it's to hold me to account. And I, I'm more than happy for anybody to do that. It's an open book. Um, I think, genuinely, this is the most important of all the committees because um, this can avoid a lot of problems further down the line and you could perhaps pick up stuff that's being missed. Whether you like it or not, I, um, I was the uh, PPS to Jenny Gordon for two years. And Jenny used to say, I don't know, believe that they're the repository of all the best ideas. He didn't say this bit, uh, which is um, but not, uh, but he didn't say that. It was a rhetorical question. And, and I think what it is is that you will have ideas. People around here will have ideas. Your colleagues will have ideas. I'm trying to get out to as many um, local authority areas as I possibly can. I spend a day every month going out somewhere and just go around the place so that I'm not in this gilded cage, if you like it. I'm not just seeing people here. So I do spend time going to community groups and speaking to everybody that I possibly can. Uh, we do have something called FASJAB, don't forget, again, which is a, a, a conduit, a mechanism for you to feed ideas through. And social justice environment. So there's a lot of stuff that, that's, that we're doing here that nowhere else in the country is done. We, we are the first or combined authority to be a real living wage authority. We signed the Armed Forces Covenant on day one. Yeah, we're, we're looking at a fairness and uh, social justice uh, charter. But there's a whole host of things that are happening. Get involved. I mean, or, um, as I say, when your members say, what, what is that? Think about what that combined authority about. Try and explain to them that it's a, a process for them where they can feed ideas into if they've got some something that they want to sell. Thank you. It's a great pleasure working with you. We've met in various incarnations in the past. Um, just a couple of questions on the report. Now, there's three distinct areas, so I'll ask some sort of three distinct questions if I can. Um, the initiative helped households into work, 4.5 million. It's very, very intensive, um, team 24 advocates and so on. But obviously, we very good, it works well. Is there a process of evaluation of this? And, you know, have your ballpark figure and what kind of target you'd like to meet there? Because obviously, all the way to people will go back to work, you know, full time jobs and all that sort of thing. But there must be some sort of bottom line, you know, so, I know that's not the first question. Okay, do you want me to ask them all together or should I? Yeah, um, the, the, the other one connects uh, with the town centre.
Center in Valley of Five Bay. Was this a specific government fund that was bid for, or was that a choice by the <coughs> authority to use five million of their own money in that particular way? And following on from that, is there not capacity for linking the town center strategy to some extent with the digital strategy, insofar as some of the smaller um, shopping parades in various parts of this kingdom uh, regenerated themselves by offering free Wi-Fi and using that to also to promote um, local products? So <coughs> is there not a possibility of linkage of two of your programs through that? And the last one, um, given the the government's very small Swansea title, the Goo, is effectively the Mersey title system, Barrage, whatever, uh, on the back there. Uh, <coughs> I think when you owe the job, um, how sort of way it became very, very lucky without having to buy the first year I've met on there with the government money. Uh, it's for 800 households uh, to have, as you said, intensive coaching, support, advice, guidance, whatever they need to try and get those people, and it's more than once, it's a household, so it's not an individual person, but to try and get, uh, and possibly intergenerational, so a mum and a son, or you know, a father and a daughter, whatever it might be, whatever the mix is, to try and get those to support, because they found that when um, people, more than one person in the same household, have similar sort of problems, you sort of bounce off each other, you help each other, you trying to, to build the support and uh, the network around each other. That's why it's being chosen like that. Um, the, uh, the process is to try and get people to a level where they feel able to go for, for job opportunities. So it's not to force people into to work. So that's why there's no outcomes in regard to um, a percentage who have to get jobs. It's more about trying to get the person um, in the right frame of mind when they believe that they're able then to really go out to the world and work. So um, we can get you an absolute breakdown of all the outcomes of what the money that we've got is being used for. It, 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 it has to be evaluated through what's called the assurance framework, but we, we're nowhere near that because it's only just started, so we're only a few months into it. Um, apparently, some of the feedback is really positive, so much so that the governments are looking, if it is as positive as we would like it to be, that they're thinking about rolling this out across the country. So we'll just have to uh, watch this space on that one. But again, as a scrutiny committee, if you want any further information, we can provide anything that you want on that one. On the town centre funding, um, it was, uh, it's our, our money, if you like, it's your money. It's um, the bank authority money, is not a specific part from central government. And so what we decided to do is um, we put all of our different funded streams into something called a single investment fund, and that's SIF. So it, this is five million, actually six million, because we're going to build up some sense. Six million from SIF funding. And that SIF funding then, again, has to meet the rigid criteria uh, of uh, the assurance framework so that we can maximize the returns on it. But it's for local authorities to do is they walk with it. It's not us saying you have to do this. They can pick the area, choose the scheme. <coughs> but a million quid, as you know, you just say it's a million quid for Southport, John. What's that going to do? It's not hardly going to touch the sides. It's to try and give capacity or build capacity within the local authority to master plan. And then it's the master plan that we need then to take to start to really try to get the pots of money that we need to regenerate. But it needs. Um, uh, there's, there's an area uh, of the water, and there's some examples to that maybe all that stuff. A baby is reinventing themselves. And you, you mentioned digital. And one of the ways is like an independent district, so there's some, somewhere over the water that's looking at introducing uh, a similar sort of thing as the Baltic Triangle. If anyone knows the Baltic Triangle, very, very successful. Somewhere over the water is looking at that, perhaps that as a model to reinvent an independent district which brings a different type of focus to that area rather than just expecting that if you're open retail at some stage people are going to come. So it's really about um, rethinking, re-engineering and asking those questions about what is South Southport for now in, you know, in austerity Britain in a post-Brexit world, what will Southport be for? So it's that sort of um, opportunity. But you're right about the digital strategy. And again, this is something 
uh, is hugely exciting for us as a region. The digital strategy is could reposition the Liverpool City region at the vanguard of what's happening in the fourth industrial revolution. And that, that should be something again that we wanted to look at. It's, it's probably the most exciting thing I think that we're doing. The other bit um, that you mentioned was um, Swansea, and, um, and I'm very aware, acutely aware, that anything that I say um, is on public record, and there's a, a camera over there where our friends who are always here, who also um, are filming this. So I don't want to say anything that's detrimental to what Swansea tried to attempt. But what I can assure you is that any scheme that comes forward from ourselves will be absolutely realistic. It will not have any, any inflated figures. It will not uh, over-egg the outputs or underplay the costs. So we've um, taken a very different approach. And we've got an uh, independent chair, uh, a fellow called Brent Cheshire. Brent Cheshire was the guy who was responsible for Bebo Bank. So he was there on day one when the first Turbank, when Turbank was, was installed. He left. Um, when it became Europe's largest offshore wind farm. So Brent Cheshire was heading up the Tidal Commission. And the Tidal Commission will report back. It's already uh, had a, an interim report, which again, I think you've all had. That interim report um, highlights some issues. It's going to be difficult. It's not an easy scheme to, to develop. It's not an easy scheme to deliver. It's certainly not an easy scheme to fund. But is it doable? Yeah, it's doable, and as technology moves on, this will take many, many years to, to come to fruition. Um, we believe that it will be a scheme that could um, wash its own face, basically. But I've gone into the difficulties and the, the, uh, the detail of this. The government wants only an energy scheme, an energy scheme, and the energy scheme is something that we look at in a 35 year window. Now for me, and again I'm going to uh, question to that on Monday to argue this, that's ridiculous. Our scheme could last 120 years. So the same, forget about the benefits of 85 years of whatever it is that you do, we just want to look at 35 years and 35 years it'll get a return. And that's because it's matched against other schemes such as wind, but such as nuclear. And they would prefer it to be judged against nuclear on a 35 year window because after 35 years on a nuclear of course we have decommissioning and, and it, it's just the methodology is absolutely skewed towards one form of energy over a renewable form of energy and that's the argument that i'm going to be making on behalf of the city region that i think um, our scheme could have ancillary benefits and could be transformational for the local city region. Um, the government just needs to listen and hopefully uh, if it does, great. If it doesn't, we will have the opportunity with a, a different government in the future. Council Marshall then And we, between ourselves and the employer, we need to find our proportion of that. 
But look, if you have another person on the train, there's a cost to it, and that cost has to be borne somewhere. So we're looking at some really unpalatable um, decisions that we're going to have to take. But it will mean that we have to look at all the options because we have to make the uh, business case stack up. Not just because we have to make a business case stack up. We had to go to the European Investment Bank to get funding for this. And uh, any changes, you have to get their uh, agreement. So it's lots and lots of issues that we still yet to tackle. Um, but I'm fairly confident that between with the goodwill of all three parties that we'll be able to, to get over the line. But it's not an easy one. Um, I mentioned before that we've got you know, the most generous concessionary travel um, scheme in the whole country. Um, we, we might have to look at that. We might have to look at other issues. Uh, fares has been mentioned. But we want to ensure that any knock-on effect is minimised as far as possible. We were looking at every alternative, believe me, to to ensure that the, uh, the cost is borne as wide as we possibly can make it. But until we, we all do the, the work, and there's this, I think, called an elasticity test that we have to do to, to, for the business case, unless we do all this work, then I can't tell you where that um, additional bit might fall. It's not going to be easy because the decision's made, now we just need to make certain that we can pay for it. Thank you, Chair, and um, thanks, Steve, for a really informative report. I don't know, because I had to go out for a bit of a coughing fit, whether anybody's brought this up, but I am on uh, one of the committees for Liverpool John and Airport, and I wondered, Steve, whether and how you feed in to their plans. They've got plans for um, changing the noise and um, navigational systems and also for changing the end of the runway. And as Mary will know, um, there's um, now a protest group about that. And that actually probably affects Alton more than it does Liverpool City Council. But obviously, this is where you've got the overview, being on the combined authority. And I wondered if you could explain um, how you might interact. Okay, uh, by 2020, we have to do something uh, called the spatial strategy. And that means that these difficult issues, the 5036, all of those sort of uh, difficult things that we need to look at at a strategic level, we need to take into consideration. Um, I've met with the airport, but to tell you the truth, I wasn't aware of some of the things that you, you, you mentioned. We were talking more about um, how we can maximise the opportunities for the visitor economy. With, Liverpool Airport um, and how Liverpool Airport might interact with Manchester Airport if we get this new connection, uh, what is called uh, Northern Powerhouse Rail, Crossrail from the North. If that happens, does it go Liverpool, Manchester Airport, Manchester City Centre, or does it go Liverpool, Liverpool Airport, Manchester Airport, Manchester City Centre? So we're looking at all of the, the, the big strategic issues. But um, I, I wasn't aware of that. I, it doesn't obviously form the, my purview, but we can certainly take uh, riches here at the back and we can take some of the issues away and we can let you know um, any of the, uh, the feedback that we get. I think they'll be getting in touch with you somehow. Oh, right? That's okay. <coughs> okay, just uh, I wanted to, to finish up this session by talking about the town centre, especially um, the satellite centre. Um, many of those satellite centres within town centres have markets, especially in this area. And uh, I, I don't know what I mean new street, but uh, that is an industry in itself. Uh, it looks great across the country. I was wondering whether it would be advantageous to talk to, to, talk to some of these industry leaders, like, like so the National Association of Business Market Authorities, which I don't know if it's next Sunday, because we can enter the answer also at the conference. Um, but there's, 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 then there's the uh, National Market Traders Federation and of course there's the uh, Associated Town Centre Managers. Um, they would be quite willing to, to speak to the city region on the on city region level uh, rather than a local level and to give an overview of what's going on around the country and, and so that you can, you can actually get a, a grasp of what's happening in the market industry, what's happening in town centres. I mean, we see it. These were, these were people who were, were 
incidentally agreed to both islands. And, and also after the year, the old passing of that should become an incident between Westminster. And this was where I was part of for three, four years. <coughs> Would I be, I'll give permission for them to contact yourself with a view to come to see you and talk to you about them. I'll give you a round of to talk about what the issues are in the town centres and especially the market industry. Spent most of my time in the north rather than south. And, and it's a huge industry, it's, it's, it's losing as much as any other industry. And, and I think markets are integral, aren't they? They're really important to the future of, of what we're trying to do. The thing that I'd say, and I'm, I'm more than happy to meet anybody, to tell you the truth, because um, we get <coughs> some good feedback and ideas and stuff that we can build into future thinking. But I don't want anyone to go away with the misapprehension that we are the delivery on. The local authorities very much just other people. We deal with this Liverpool used to have market traders group or whatever it was, body of somebody uh, that they, they had a number of years ago. Um, and that will still be the conduit for the decision making process. It's not the market <coughs> authorities area of, um, of expertise or, or that it should be. But if there's something that we could then use to feed back to our local authority areas um, through the, the, the mayors and leaders of meetings, I'm more than happy to do that, yeah. But uh, as I say, the, the decisions lie very much with local authority in our market. Any more questions?
needs to be managed. Um, to move that along, uh, this is a diagram which is it, it, it's very simplified. It's just trying to show where the kind of combined authorities budget uh, split between income and expenditure fits together, and it, it is just the main components of it. But what I want to do is in this in this grant area, and, and grants are um, at the heart of what the combined authority is about. So we have grants from government of at the time I present that. Um, it was gain share, which is a £30 million a year that we get from government uh, as a result of devolution and our devolution deal. We have the special rail grant, which has always existed, that pays for the Mersey Rail franchise. That's around £80 million a year, but it, it used to be more, and it will be less in future. That's the financial challenge we've got. Local growth fund, um, again, really significant packages of money in local growth fund. On top of that, there are new funding streams all the time, so my brother has already mentioned um, the, the, the Housing First initiative. We've also become, from next September, we'll be responsible for the adult education budget, that's 50 odd million pound again on top of that. And there are future rounds of local growth fund, there's, it's not quite called local growth fund, but there's a transport and cities fund, which will pay for transport infrastructure investment over the next few years. That's £120 million. Pound. So all that money that goes into grants, the special rail grant aside, that's a separate, the special rail grant pays for Mersey Rail effectively. But everything else we've got, which is related to devolution, that goes into this single investment fund, and that funds the capital programme. So that has funded all of the um, all of the features that's already been mentioned. So the Gold North Station. Improvements on Newton Willow Station, Holton Curve, but also non transport, um, or not directly transport anyway. So that Alstrom receives support from that within Holton. Um, Shakespeare for the North, which, you know, when that progresses, that will be from here. And that, you know, as will lifts at Prescott Station. And, you know, and the cruise line terminal, which is probably the biggest award that um, the combined authority has, has thus far. Announced its involvement and support with. But on the, on the revenue side of it, they, they tend to be capital. On the revenue budget, the combined authority is still dominated by its pre existing transport responsibilities for motor travel. Because it's transport that the combined authority, more than anything else, is involved in directly providing. So that's funded by Mersey Tunnel Tolls and by the transport levy predominantly. It's important because if you see the government grants here, particularly for scrutiny to be aware of, we don't really get any say in that other than influencing the lobbying, or so ultimately someone else decides how much we get by way of grant. But for tolls and for the transport levy, it's the combined authority that is making those decisions locally through its transport committee or influenced by its transport committee. But obviously, overview of scrutiny will have a role in that within budget setting because those. Those are big numbers. Total tolls is around £40 million pound a year. The transport levy, £95 million a year. Now, total tolls used to be significantly higher a number of years ago. Transport levy has been completely changed. The transport levy was £127 million pound a year not that long ago, three or four years ago. And uh, in partnership with the districts and the transport committee was instrumental in this, it's been reduced now to 95 million, and that recognises that your financial position is such that you couldn't continue to um, support nurse and travel services at the same level as, um, as was previously the case. So there are certain changes that have been involved in reducing the transport levy to that degree, one of which is that the tunnel tolls um, is used, the tunnel tolls is used in part to offset some of the cost of other other emergency travel services to take the burden from the transport levy. <coughs> so there is a, a, a big relationship between tunnel tolls income and what you pay through the transport levy. Those are the main bits of it. The new part of it is obviously non-transport. So obviously these go together to fund transport funding, sorry. Um, 
as you'd expect. That forms MERS and travel and the tunnel tolls, and sorry, the operation of the MERS and tunnels. Then you have a new part of it, which is really administering all these functions here, which are combined authority running costs. Now, the net cost of the combined authority in the current year, in the current budget, will be somewhere along the lines of, of six million. The gross cost will be higher than that, but a lot of that will be funded through the new money um, that, that's coming attached to those grants. Well, the net cost this year will be around six million pounds. So we've had to find a way of funding that six million pound because there's no money that's come from the government to fund that directly. So in the first year of the combined authority, before Steve arrived, um, we top sliced some of the grants. It was obviously a much more modest combined authority cost at the time. This year, um, we have had to identify with combined authority leaders a package uh, of local income to support the combined authority this year. I think that's pretty much a, a, a one-off. Um, Part of the budget this year, you, you'll recall, was a financial package agreed with the districts, whereby the districts have found um, sufficient funding to enable us to carry on for a year, um, for this year, funding the combined authority, while we try to look for a more sustainable financial footing that will move us ahead. Um, and we've commissioned a piece of work from, from SIFA. Um, that's ongoing at the moment, and so all of your chief execs, treasurers and leaders will have been invited to participate in that. Some of them have been interviewed over the last week or so, some of them um, this week and next week. The, that report needs to uh, feed back to the Merrim leaders by the end of September. It will influence this year's budget setting process, and the scope of that work is to look at the financial powers the combined authority has got, to raise money locally, and the scope it's got to, um, to to use the funding we've got from government to offset some of its costs. But it's also looking at, and this is why SIFA are involved, because they've got a national footprint, it's looking at government's expectations of us both now and in the future, and it's looking at, it's taking a view of <coughs> what other combined authority areas are doing, people faced with the same issue. It has to be said though that the, the problem is more challenging here and this relates, this relate, I'm careful that we're in a public setting, but this relates to the, the grant position that the government has put you as districts in this area into. Um, in, we recognise that the cuts in this area to local government funding have been really severe um, and you know, my background is, you know, I've, I've, at one of the local authorities in 2010, so I'm also aware of it. Your financial position is such that we can expect you to support the combined authority to the extent that government probably anticipates that that, that would occur. So it is the case that in two other city region combined authorities that we would like to compare ourselves with, Birmingham and, and Greater Manchester, the local authorities pay quite a significant subscription each year to the combined authorities' costs. I think that the Merrim the leaders recognise, as we do, that your financial situation at the moment is not, um, you know, would not enable that to happen easily. Um, and again, that is something that SIFA is, is looking at. SIFA is also in discussion with ministers about <coughs> what they expect us to do. So there's a big piece of work strategically ongoing that came from that original um, budget decision in February to provide an interim solution to this year's budget but we'll look for a much more long-term solution. And clearly overview of scrutiny will, will be involved in that process as it emerges. You will never, uh, you know, this, you'll see this slide when I send the package out, you'll be able to take more review of it. It's just putting some numbers onto that previous diagram. It's basically just meant to demonstrate that combined authority running costs, significant as they are, are a very small proportion of the overall combined authority envelope. It's a, there's a huge amount of new money and a huge amount of existing money in terms of travel that needs to be managed and we need capacity in order to manage that. Um, 
that's reproduced from this year's budget, and you, you'll find that in, in February's budget. I think what I picked up from the, the workshop we had um, back in, I think, May or April was that combined authority running costs, being the new elements of it, were of most interest. So I've reproduced um, what was the uh, appendix to February's report, specifically around combined authority running costs. So this is the new, if you like, element of it. This isn't around MERS and travel, it's not about MERS and tunnels. It just picks up the new costs around a mural combined authority. So what we had in the budget was costs, costs around the direct cost of the MERS office. So not the combined authorities running costs, obviously a much smaller number, which is related to the MER himself and those staff who were immediately around him. Um, so an assistant uh, and as a political advisor provided for within, within, within that. And it, it, it is a relatively, it, well, it is a small office. Uh, there is an element in there for communications and stakeholder engagement, which was put in in the current year, recognising that for a new combined authority, as we are, there needs to be quite a lot of getting out there and engaging with the public. So there's fairly, there is a quite significant budget for that this year. And then the mayor had a an amount set aside to to pay for the mayoral priorities, which were articulated in the mayor's manifesto. But at the time of preparing the budget, were um, we're not in a delivery phase. So those were particularly tidal energy and the digital economy. So we recognise that the MER would need a significant, um, a significant amount of money to take those really big areas forward and into, a bit, into proving a business case and into moving it into a delivery phase. So that's principally what was in the MER priorities. But, but, but Steve has also used um, part of that funding to pay for the culture, um, the cultural aspects that we've just talked about. So the borough of culture and St. Helens, that's, that's, that's part of the Merrill Priority Fund this year. And he's also used that to create a, to create the scope for the apprentice tickets. So all of those priorities that were articulated in his manifesto, a lot of those have been taken forward through that. And as we move the budget into next year, that won't be a budget as such for mobile priorities. It will translate into a budget for digital, a budget for tidal energy, a budget for apprenticeship, because they'll become baked into the budget, hopefully. Well, that's what we anticipate anyway. Chief Executive's Office, again, there's cost for that, which includes PAs as well as clearly just the, the, the Chief Executive. You'll all be aware that the chief executive role is being fulfilled on an interim basis by <coughs> Rogers. So his substantive post, which is MP of Mersey Travel, is vacant. Um, so that actually hasn't transpired into additional costs to the whole organisation because um, we've not backfilled that Mersey Travel MD post. As you would expect, because of devolution and uh, the new responsibilities from the government, Policy area is, is a very large area of activity. Um, there's a new policy director, relatively new, 